Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nirav Shah. I'm the director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And I'm joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Wambrew from Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Wambrew and I will be providing everyone an update on the COVID-19 situation for the state of Maine for today, Friday, November 6th, 2020. I'll provide a, a quick synopsis on where things stand from a public health perspective and then turn it over to Commissioner Lambrew. Right now, across the state of Maine, there are a total of 7,444 total cases of COVID-19, representing an increase of 184 cases since yesterday. Of those, 6,565 are confirmed, an increase of 148 confirmed cases, and 879 are probable an increase of 36 probable cases. Right now in the state of Maine, 37 people are currently in the hospital with COVID-19, 14 of whom are in the intensive care unit and three of whom are on a ventilator. Just in the past 30 days, 47 people have been hospitalized with COVID-19. 150 individuals have passed away with COVID, the same number as yesterday, and 5,830 have recovered, an increase of 79 recoveries. Of our cases, 1,241 are healthcare workers, nine more healthcare workers compared to yesterday. Taking a look at where the new cases are coming from, of yesterday's cases, 31% were from Cumberland County and 16% were from York County. I'd like to turn now to talk about some of the key outbreaks that Maine's CDC is engaged in. But before I do, just a, a quick note, although we have typically talked about outbreaks during these meetings, given the level of community spread and transmission that we have seen now in Maine, the chief areas of risk for each and every one of you are not necessarily those areas associated with outbreak sites. To put it differently, the risk is everywhere around us, not just at locations where outbreaks may be occurring. Just in the past two days, Maine CDC has opened outbreaks across the state. One is at the Russell Park Rehabilitation Center in Lewiston, where we are aware of four residents and two staff members. We've also opened an outbreak into the Walpole Woodworkers site in Pittsfield after detecting cases among nine staff members. In addition, at Sunrise Opportunities, an assisted living facility in Machias, we've opened an investigation after detecting cases among four residents and one staff member. And finally, at the Waldo County General Hospital, we've opened an investigation after detecting cases among four staff members. Turning next to some updates along around our testing metrics. Right now, across the state, our seven day weighted positivity rate now stands at 1.73%. To put that number in perspective, two weeks ago, that number was 0.54%. So our positivity rate in Maine has more than tripled just in two weeks. Now, the reason I use two weeks is because that is one complete incubation period for the virus. It's a total life cycle for the virus is spread from person to person, and hence why I look at things in two week blocks. In terms of testing volume, the current testing volume for PCR tests in Maine stands at 558 tests for every 100,000 people across the state. I'd also like to provide a quick snapshot into the number of close contacts that individuals talk or give us as we investigate their cases. Again, as Maine CDC becomes aware of cases, we interview those individuals who have tested positive. One of the questions that we ask them is to help generate a list of all the close contacts with whom they have come into contact during the period when they could have been spreading the virus. The average number of close contacts 
from cases throughout our activation period, from March all the way through the present, the average number cumulatively has been 3.5, with a range of no close contacts all the way up to 174 close contacts. But if you take a look at just the cases that we diagnosed or that we detected rather, just in the month of October alone, and you just look at those individuals, their number of close contacts in October was 5.8, significantly higher than the cumulative average of 3.5. Now this number is important. It tells us a few things. The first is that it tells us that people are out and about and interacting with their friends, family, and coworkers much more than they were earlier in the pandemic. But it also provides us a glimpse about how the nature and the contours of the pandemic now differ from March, April, May, and earlier. Because, there, because on average, people who are diagnosed now have mo more close contacts, it's just statistically likely that they will have transmitted COVID-19 to other people and more people than they would have earlier. We'll get back to this in just a bit as we talk a little bit more about masks. But finally, before I turn things over to Commissioner Lambrew, I wanted to just provide a quick synopsis and analysis of our situation right now. The bottom line is that the situation in Maine with respect to COVID-19 continues to show rapidly expanding community transmission. Two weeks ago today in Maine, we had 6,095 cases total and 31 new cases that day. Today, we have added 1,349 new cases just in the past two weeks and have again set another daily record for the number of new cases just today. To put that number in perspective, 18% of all of the COVID-19 cases in Maine have occurred just in the past two weeks. And sadly, it's not slowing down. Indeed, it's just the opposite. This week alone has brought a succession of days where the daily case count was also the one day new record high. Adding on top of that, the positivity rate, which as I mentioned a moment ago, now stands at 1.73%, has more than tripled in one incubation period alone. Hospitalizations too are up sharply. Two weeks ago today, there were eight people total hospitalized, none of whom was in the ICU and none of whom was on a ventilator. Today, the total number stands at 37. Why does any of this matter? Well, it tells us a lot about what's happening. In addition to just a much higher number of people who are affected directly by COVID-19, it also raises risks for, the, risks for the future. Today's cases in the community can turn into tomorrow's clusters in the community, which a few days after that can turn into outbreaks in the community. For example, right now in Maine, long-term care facilities are a particular area of concern with eight facilities experiencing outbreaks right now. That number could continue to increase. As more cases become detected in the community, those individuals, who may work in settings like long-term care facilities, hospitals, and even in our schools, could continue interacting in their workplaces and potentially introduce the virus into those places where we know vulnerable individuals are, such as long-term care facilities. That's why one of the best things that each and every person who's watching today can do to keep vulnerable members of our society safe is to take steps today to keep yourself safe because every case today can turn into an outbreak tomorrow as the rates of community transmission continue to increase. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to Commissioner Lambert. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. <clears throat> today, the state of Maine has taken additional actions to further protect Maine's children, athletes, coaches, teachers, and families in the face of rising COVID-19 counts. This includes updating and aligning the COVID-19 checklist for community sports with the Maine Principals Association's school sports guidance. 
we have heard concerns that loopholes are allowing community spread. So we are changing a number of our recommendations to requirements in the community sports checklist. This revised checklist also aligns the timing of practice and competition for moderate risk sports to be the same as that for school-based winter sports like ice hockey and basketball. Additionally, experience from other states has found that wearing face coverings during competition can work to keep athletes safe. As such, Maine now requires participants in sports activities organized by K-12 schools or by leagues and communities to wear face coverings. This is just one of several actions we have taken to combat the rapid spread of COVID-19 in Maine. Governor Mills announced yesterday a return to a limit of 50 people for indoor gatherings. And she also strengthened the face covering requirement to clarify when and where one must wear one in a new executive order. We will continue to look for targeted effective ways to protect the public health while restarting Maine's economy during this global pandemic. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Commissioner Lambrew. Uh, before we turn over to our colleagues in the media, Commissioner Lambrew noted a change that, that Governor Mills has made to the executive orders outlining under what conditions and where individuals should be wearing face coverings. I'd like to take a second to walk through some of the scientific basis for why that common sense measure has been instituted. As the commissioner noted, the new executive order from Governor Mills primarily focused and expanded where individuals must wear a mask, namely in public settings. This is again, a common sense measure, given what we are seeing around high levels of community transmission across the state. Again, I wanna take a second to walk through the scientific rationale underlying this. COVID-19 is spread from person to person through the air, either in the form of droplets or smaller particles called aerosols. We naturally expel and exhale those droplets or aerosols when we talk, sing, shout, or otherwise interact with others anytime we might be talking, singing, or shouting. There are a number of factors that drive whether the COVID-19 virus is able to spread successfully from person to person. One of those is how much of the virus is expelled when folks are, who have the virus are singing, coughing, sneezing, or otherwise just talking from one person to another. The other factors are how close any two people are and how long their interaction is. What masks do is address the first one of those. How much virus gets unleashed into the air by someone who has COVID? What a mask can do is significantly reduce the transmission of COVID from you to anybody else who you might have been interacting with in close proximity for a long period of time. The other really critical reason why masking is important has to do with the manner in which COVID-19 is spread. Much of the transmission of COVID-19 happens before people have even a single symptom. This makes it different from other respiratory viruses where much of the spread happens after people have developed symptoms. A virus that spreads after people have symptoms isn't going to spread as much because by the time people have symptoms, they've already taken steps to keep themselves indoors or indeed be laid up in bed. But with COVID-19, being able to spread before people have symptoms, well, what that means is that somebody could unknowingly interact with somebody while they have COVID and spread the virus. By wearing a mask everywhere in every public setting, you reduce your likelihood that you could unknowingly spread COVID-19. Now we recognize that as with any new measure, there will be questions. We expect that. And that's one reason we're here to talk with everyone today. But there are a few key principles to keep in mind 
as you are asking yourself whether you need to wear a mask in a certain place. The first is to think about whether it's a public setting. The reason the executive order focuses on public settings is because those are the places where we are the most likely to encounter other people. When you're out and about in a public setting, you don't know where or when or whether you will encounter another person. So Governor Mills's new rule takes into account the chance encounters that we have with others every single day. Her executive order is designed to make all of these encounters in public settings less risky, especially in light of the rising levels of community uh, transmission we are seeing. Common sense still applies here. No matter where you are, if you can encounter somebody while you are out, wear a mask. That is the simplest way to help all of us keep a lid on COVID-19. These are common sense rules that we're, we're happy to chat about, but my bottom line and my ask for everybody today is to wear a mask and do the right thing. So with that, we'll turn things over to our colleagues in the media. First question today goes to Ashley Blackford from WAGM. Hi, Dr. Shaw. I'm wondering about um, if you're able to speak about false positives um, and what the CDC recommends if someone were to say have a positive test and then after that have two negative tests, what does the CDC recommend for close contacts of that person? Does a negative test cancel out a positive test? Ashley, I'm going to answer your question under the assumption that we're talking about the same kind of test in each of these scenarios. Typically, that is a PCR test, the test that most laboratories across the state run. In that situation, negative tests don't cancel out positive tests. Someone could have enough virus in their body on the day they got their first test, but because of their immune system doing what it does, when they got retested, may turn out to be negative. So a negative test does not erase, cancel out, or reverse the, 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 the diagnosis of COVID-19. In addition, it doesn't necessarily eliminate the requirement to isolate. Maine CDC's case investigators are well-versed in the latest protocols from the US CDC about when someone can safely end their period of isolation. It's a highly fact-intensive inquiry, so I'm not gonna make any general pronouncements because it does vary by person to person. But the bottom line here, Ashley, is that a negative test does not obviate a positive test, assuming all of them were PCRs. Uh, I'm gonna turn next to Dustin at New England Cable News. Thanks, Dr. Shah. Uh, talking about um, the public settings, I think for clarity for people, I mean, what are some of the distinct situations that you are thinking of? I mean, are we talking jogging outside as well as just moving around any indoor space in an office? I mean, is, is this, this is a blanket rule, it sounds like, because there's certain nuance in there that people were having questions about. And Dustin, we, we anticipate that. Again, it's, it's a new rule. Uh, there's going to be questions. We will, we will make sure we help answer them. As to your first question, if someone is outside in a city sidewalk or something of that nature, walking, jogging, that's a place where they could have chance encounters or even stop and chat with somebody. And that is considered a public setting per the words of the executive order itself. So that is somewhere where a face covering would be required. And I'll add that, now, people, I'll just add, we, sorry, we appreciate that there's lots of questions, but the reality is, it's a common sense rule. When you're asking the question of yourself, if you think there's a need to do it, you probably should. We did post some frequently asked questions on the Keep Maine Healthy website to try to begin to answer some of these questions but we really do trust the common sense of the people of Maine to know when it's appropriate to wear a face covering. On the question of the adjustment of the travel list, and I'll jump back to my other question in a second, but sticking on the travel thing for a moment, is there a, a time when we might see Massachusetts back on the quarantine list in the next week or two? So we evaluate the data qualitative and quantitative regularly, especially now given what's been going on. We did remove all states but Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont from the uh, requirement to either get a negative test or quarantine when you come to Maine from those states. Uh, we can't 
speculate on what will happen in the future. Our policy is what it is for now, but we do closely monitor the situation and we'll update you accordingly. And lastly, Dr. Shaw, in context for the whole year, are we worse off than we have been at any point? Are we somewhere in the middle? Are we heading in a really bad direction? I know you sort of touched on this, but can you put us where we are in this pandemic based on what we know and where we've been? Dustin, I think, I don't wanna characterize it in, you know, in exactly you know, good, bad, worse, less worse. Um, we're in a different phase of the pandemic now. Uh, previously, much of the transmission that we were seeing was being driven and resulting from outbreaks. Uh, many of those were in, say, long-term care and other healthcare settings. The complexion of the outbreak and the pandemic now are much different. What's happening now is sustained community transmission, often from small group gatherings, not large group gatherings. That community transmission, I fear, and it is likely, will then start unto itself generating follow-on outbreaks across the state. So that, that, that marks it as different. Now, there are other ways in which things are different as well. There's far more testing right now, both in the number of people who are getting tested and the type of people who are getting tested. Earlier in the pandemic, when reagent supply was limited across the country, those who were being tested were those who were healthcare workers in the hospital or those who had had direct contact with a known case. Nowadays, under our, our standing orders, as well as the swab and send sites, anybody in the state can get tested, irrespective of their exposure. If they feel like they need to be tested, they can be. So we're also doing a lot more testing, which helps us get a better sense into what's going on than we had earlier. I don't, again, I, I don't wanna characterize things as necessarily better or worse, they're definitely different, definitely concerning, and we all have got to take steps right now. I'm going to turn next to Marissa from WGME. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Um, I'm wondering, you know, if this new mask mandate is really followed, what kind of difference do you think it could make? Uh, there's a well-known, thanks for that question, Marissa. There's a, a, a very well-respected um, group of epidemiologists based at the University of, of Washington. And they have created models to help estimate how much, with what intensity, and how quickly widespread mask wearing could help states as well as the entire country get a grip on the pandemic. What they have estimated, I don't, I don't have the numbers directly in front of me right now, but I can get them, but they have estimated that universal masking in, of the nature that Governor Mills has put in in her executive order could very quickly start lowering rates of COVID-19 for the scientific reasons that I outlined. I, again, I, we'll, we'll try to get you the, the numbers. Of, they are available. The name of their institute is called the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, IHME. And they've got their models in very easily accessible form. And they walk through the direct and immediate, uh, well, not immediate, but within one incubation period, impact that widespread mask wearing could have. Um, we can get that for you, or alternatively, Marissa, it's very easily accessible on their website. And that's a lot of what we base our understanding of the impact of masking. The bottom line, and, and just to really put a, a really fine point on this, the bottom line is that widespread masking would have a rapid and, and significant uh, impact on the rates of transmission of COVID-19 across the state and across the country. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Steve Betts at the Courier Gazette. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Just a real quick question first. How many uh, cases were there at, in the outbreak at Waldo County General Hospital? Uh, Waldo County, Steve, um, let me just make sure I, I didn't misspeak. We opened it with uh, four cases among okay. staff members at Waldo County. Four staff members, thank you. And also, so this is a question maybe to the commissioner. The, the most frequent comments I get from people is, they go into stores, these are some of the larger stores, and people are not wearing masks once they get in, they'll take them off. What do people do? Yeah, so we continue to work on multiple fronts. Number one is education. The more we can communicate to people why we're asking them to do something that's challenging, we're hopeful that the more that they will take that extra step to do so. 
Second, for large retail establishments, we do have a requirement that they help us enforce. They can deny entry to people coming into those retail stores as a means of protecting their workers and their other customers. The most recent executive order didn't extend any enforcement to different organizations, but did say post information on the outside and other organizations can also have the choice of having people not be able to come into their, their indoor space to protect other customers. And we do have a range of enforcement tools that should education and should reminders and other tools fail, we can use. But we hope that that's a last resort and not a first resort. Well, we're, we're eight months into this pandemic now and things are getting worse. At what point would stricter enforcement, such as what, 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 what would the choices be? I mean, if this continues and people, even though it's a minority, are not wearing masks, what's going to be done? Sure. And just as a reminder, you know, what we did with the executive order yesterday was two things. Number one is we really did try to, you know, end those loopholes. So, for example, if you go to a restaurant, our previous guidance said you need to wear a face covering when you're going to and from a table or to or from a restroom. What we did clarify is, no, you actually need to wear it while you're sitting there and not eating or drinking. That's a good example of one way that clear guidance can help have people who follow those rules follow it better. We also, in the executive order, included some delegation authority to begin to give us some more tools should we need them to begin to try to address persistent noncompliance with these guidelines. And while we do place a high priority on voluntary compliance, we also do recognize the very real threat of this virus. As such, in the event of you know, persistent noncompliance, the state has the option of taking activities such as suspending a facility's operating license, violations of the executive orders are certain types of crimes that are punishable up to 180 days in prison and a thousand dollar fine. We have not had to use those sorts of remedies to date, but we do recognize, especially with the case rates rising, community spread increasing, we're gonna take those additional steps like closing some of those loopholes and face covering wearing going back to the 50 person indoor gathering limit to try to do our best short of some of these harsher measures. Thank you. Steve, I, I, uh, I wanna just go back to Waldo County really quickly. I, I did not provide appropriate context and I, I feel like it's important to do so. Sure. Um, I, I, mentioned, uh, I mentioned outbreaks of this nature for transparency because I want people to know what's happening around them and what we are working on. But in the case, for example, of Waldo County General Hospital, if you are not feeling well, if you need to seek medical attention, you should not be dissuaded from going to that hospital. This is not to suggest that there is something amiss there. I, I share this because it's important to do so, but I also simultaneously want, I do not want people to fear seeking healthcare if they live in that area, if that's where they go. Uh, they should absolutely feel comfortable seeking care at Waldo County General because outbreak investigations are just that. It's a mechanism where we open up a direct line of communication with the hospital to make sure they've got everything they need to keep tabs on what's going on. So if you are in that area, do not be dissuaded from seeking care of that. If you need medical attention, please utilize your, your healthcare system. And if that's Waldo County General Hospital, do not fear that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna turn now to Patty White at Maine Public. Hi, Dr. Shaw. You explained why the executive order focuses on public settings and why that's important, but we're hearing that the transmission is being driven by small household gatherings. So can you tell us a little bit more about how does the executive order address that specific problem of small household gatherings? Yeah. Um, I'll start and then again, Commissioner Rambrew and I are happy to, to go into details, Patty. On its face, the, the this particular executive order does not talk about what people may be doing in their private lives in their houses. Uh, with their friends and family. But I don't think that for a second should alter whether people are wearing face coverings in those settings. If you are happening, if you happen to have folks who are coming over uh, and you're not sure whether the bubble they're in is a tight bubble, I, I think we are absolutely at the time period where wearing face coverings while just casually hanging out with some friends is the right thing to do, especially if you're indoors. 
There's a couple of things happening scientifically, Patty, that make indoor, small indoor gatherings riskier as we go into the winter months. The first is that the colder weather means that the gatherings are just likely to be indoors, whereas previously they would have been outdoors. But there's another thing that happens as it gets colder, which is the air becomes drier. That has two, that has two impacts. The first is that it means that the droplets that can carry the virus are smaller and can travel a longer distance. The second thing is that it can also mean that our respiratory tracts are less able to fend off the virus. All of those things at this time period mean that if you're gathering indoors with folks, wearing a mask is something that should absolutely be considered. Thanks. Um, and one other question. You said earlier this week, um, I mean, you've been talking about how troubling the trend is that we're seeing and that if we were to, to get to the point of 200 or 250 new daily cases, that would be a problem. And we're not too far off from that 200 number. What other, you know, after this executive order, what would the next mitigation measure be? I mean, what types of things are you looking at? Is it helpful for people to know maybe what's coming down the pike, you know? If, mm -hmm. if things don't change. Well, I'll go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah, I'll, I'll just begin. I, I mean, I think we are always focused on what we can learn from other places, other states, other settings to see what are those tools that we could adopt that are both effective, but also that recognize the balance between public health and the economy. So there's a lot of different measures that a lot of different states have taken. We're looking at them all. It's premature to announce which ones we're going to adopt but I think you'll be hearing from us frequently as the days go on, if the case count continues with additional steps that main people, main businesses, the main economy can take to try to combat this challenge because we do know that a healthy population is the best path forward to a healthy economy. Thank you. Uh, next up is Amy Brown. Thank you, Dr. Shah. We've had a lot of questions in the past several days about compliance. I'm trying to boil them down into sort of one or two questions that encompass what's being asked most often. And I think, Commissioner Lambrew, this might be for you. Uh, the loophole that allows people to not wear a mask if they have a medical condition is the one that is most often exploited. We see people on social media just telling people to, uh, to say that they have a medical condition and the stores have to let them in. Months ago, I asked on one of these calls about whether some system could be put in place similar to the cards that people display in their vehicles so they can park in designated spots where they get a card certificate, something from their medical provider if they really can't wear a mask into a store and they are required to show that. It doesn't disclose what their condition is so it doesn't violate any of their privacy. And it takes the store owners and restaurant owners out of the dangerous situation where they're having to be police and they're not equipped to do that. Is anything like that being considered or anything else to support these businesses that just don't want to put their workers in harm's way trying to enforce these orders? So I want to start with a reminder that the vast majority of people in Maine are following the rules. They're not trying to cheat. They're not, you know, not only not trying to cheat, but also not falsely saying they have a medical condition to in order to avoid the requirement that we have here. So we feel good about the level of compliance that we've seen. We always can do better and we encourage people to try to do that. We do have legitimate reasons why people shouldn't wear face coverings. Sometimes it's due to a person who, they, who may be deaf and need to be able to read their coworkers, you know, lips or to have other sorts of signals to be able to do this. There's face shields that could be used in those circumstances. There are other accommodations. So we respect the fact that there is a distinct subsection of people in Maine who do have medical conditions that we must respect. All that said, I think looking at the experience in different places and different states, we haven't yet seen a system that works. It's complicated. The same people who would cheat in a situation about self attestation would probably work that extra step to cheat and find the false certification to be able to go into a store. So we do continue to look to see if there are alternative means to help uh, businesses who are enforcing the requirements do so. Uh, we haven't yet seen one that's efficient and effective, but we'll continue to look, but I'll go back to where I began. We think the best way to ensure compliance is to explain why, why wearing face, face covering matters, protecting yourself and protecting your neighbor. 
Do you really believe that there's a significant part of the population who hasn't heard that yet? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think that we all always have to remind ourselves, like all of us will forget after months of doing something, you get distracted, you begin to walk away from your desk or out of your car without a face covering. I think it's important to continually remind people of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Okay, and my next question, I think might be more for Commissioner Johnson, but I'm going to throw it out there in case either of you can answer it. Another thing I've heard from a couple of people about this week is the form on the DECD website for reporting possible non-compliance with the governor's orders on masks or distancing. When people have gone to try to use that, it states very clearly, you have to enter your name and your name becomes part of the public record. People are concerned about doing that when it's their neighbors, maybe their employers that they're concerned about, and they want to know if there's another way that they can make a report if they are concerned that someone is even in one situation I was told about had just recently been exposed and was still in a very uh, public kind of position. Who do they report to? And also what happens to those reports after the, after the DECD receives them? Are they being investigated? Uh, so I will partly answer the question. I'm not sure I know all the answers to your questions by saying that there is, I know there is a system to respond to the people who submit them. We have people on our team, teams throughout state government, because they do get routed to the appropriate agencies who do review them. For example, our health inspection program that uh, regulates eating establishments and lodging establishments has looked at hundreds of these over the summer. They are reviewed, they are investigated as appropriate, and they are acted on as well. So I would say that the system has been an effective tool for all of us as we've begun to try to reach out to local health officers, local establishments in identifying areas of non-compliance, uh, but we can look into the alternative system for Stop. anonymous complaints. Yes, something for uh, someone who wants to be a whistleblower but doesn't want to lose their job would be what the people I'm hearing from would, would be asking for. Thank you. Yep, we'll get back to you. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Allison Ross at WMTW. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thanks so much for taking my question today. So kind of going off of what Amy Brown was just saying, not to characterize people, but most people watching these press conferences twice a week, once a week are generally the same people following the rules, yet we're still seeing these cases skyrocket. So what is the main CDC or really just any state official doing to reach that population of people who might not want to listen to officials or who are ignoring this virus? Mm -hmm. So I'll start there, uh, Allison. You know, we, we communicate with folks about where things stand through a number of different platforms. This is one of them, uh, but there are other ways in which we are out there talking with folks, whether that's on morning radio shows and other interviews with other sources of media where, as you noted, folks who are tuning in right now may not be, or there may be other segments of the population who may not be tuning in that we're also trying to touch base with. So it's not just one channel, it's multi-channeled. But the, the other thing though is, and I, th I think your question raises this and puts it in focus. Uh, although a lot of the folks who are tuning in right now are likely to abide and do the right thing and wear face coverings in public settings, as we're seeing a lot more transmission happening in smaller groups, I guess the question now for everyone to ask is, are you doing all the right things even in those small groups? Uh, are you still getting together with small groups of friends and family where transmission events could happen? If you are, are you doing the right things by wearing face coverings and those? So I think as we go into this next phase, we'll indoors more, the air conditions are different, there's less ventilation indoors, we're all going to have a brand new set of questions to ask ourselves to make sure we're doing all the right things. Um, I'm going to turn next to Charlie at the BDN. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Um, my first question is about the Waldo County Hospital cases. Do you know, have you established how that, um, well, I guess I'm wondering, is, it, is that outbreak tied to the outbreak at the Brooks Church? Uh, and in particular, whether the, the pastor from the church who works at the hospital may have spread it there? Yep. Um, Charlie, as, as you can imagine, that, that is the key question 
that we are trying to suss out as kind of question number one in our outbreak. Um, at this time, we don't yet have a clear answer to that. Uh, the way we investigate outbreaks with that question being in sharp focus is to look at things like for all the other three staff members, those align, was there any possible interaction between the pastor and where he was situated in the hospital and any of the others may have been uh, who, who, are, who we know to be positive? Those are the types of questions that our case investigator, our, our outbreak investigator asks. So it requires looking at things like the map of the hospital, work patterns, work schedules, things like that. At this time, we don't have a clear answer to that, but as, you, as your question denotes, that's one of our top questions. But at the same time, in the setting of a county where there has been higher rates of community transmission, we also have to keep in mind the possibility that there could be an outbreak not related to one employee, but that four separate employees may have been exposed elsewhere and just, again, may have been detected because of their association with the hospital. That's why earlier uh, in, in connection with Steve's question, I was just really clear to make, make it, you know, I wanted to be really, really clear. Don't be dissuaded from seeking care if you're not feeling well. Okay, um, and related, uh, a more general question about hospitals. Are you aware of any COVID-19 transmission that's actually happened between healthcare providers and hospitals and patients or, um, uh, yeah, how, how do you establish that any of that's happening? I think I've heard that it, it may not be common, but are you aware of any? In, in the recent era with COVID-19, by which, um, you know, summer through the present, um, transmission in Maine, as well as at the national level, as has been documented in, in some uh, well-validated and well well publicized journal articles, which we can we can get for you. That type of transmission from healthcare worker to patient or resident has thankfully become much less common. Uh, and that's almost entirely owing to the widespread and proper use of PPE. However, earlier in the pandemic, there were cases of transmission, particularly in long-term care facilities between workers, between staff members and residents. Thankfully, that has become less common. Uh, now, we do have still eight outbreaks that are open right now in long-term care and other congregate facilities. I don't have at my fingertips, Charlie, um, any epidemiological basis one way or the other to say that in those facilities, there has been transmission from, uh, from staff member to resident. I can't rule it out either. I'd, I'd have to sit, uh, sit down with the epi team and really get a better sense. Um. Just a quick follow-up then. So uh, I get the emphasis on long-term care there. How about uh, hospitals specifically? Uh, yeah, that's right. That was the, the focus of your question. Um, Charlie, I'm, I'm not aware of any documented epidemiologically sound links of transmission in, in the recent few months, but, I, but I don't take that to the bank yet. Let me check or we'll have Robert check with our epi team to see, um, I don't want to misspeak. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to turn next to Jordan Bailey at the, at the Portland Phoenix. Hello, um, thank you for taking my question. I'm, I'm asking about the outbreaks at Maine Correctional Center and Maine State Prison on if, if you have, um, I did speak with Commissioner Liberty this morning, so I got some of the details, but do you have any assessment on how those are being contained? Um, I'll, I have two more questions. I'll just ask them up front. And also, has contact tracing linked any of the initial positives among staff with any other outbreaks? And has the CB, CDC been involved in enforcement or encouragement of staff compliance with mask and distancing guidelines? Sure. Um, so, uh, Jordan, as to your first and third questions, I, I don't have anything beyond what Commissioner Liberty likely shared uh, with you already. He probably gave you the latest numbers and such as well. And then as to your middle question uh, with respect to um, uh, the contact tracing and any other connections, that process is underway at this time. We have not identified any staff members as being part of any other outbreaks yet. That doesn't mean that it's not the case, but we just haven't found any epidemiological links uh, but that is part of what we try to do as we investigate these outbreaks, uh, as we did with, with 
that say the wedding in Millinocket, we look at not just outbreaks, but linkages between outbreaks themselves to see if there are any common individuals. We haven't identified at this time, uh, but that investigation is underway and ongoing. Thanks. Uh, I'm gonna turn next to Morgan Sturdivant at WABI. Hi, Dr. Shaw, Commissioner Lambrew. Um, my questions are about uh, sports student uh, athletes. Can you talk a little bit more about the decision to for the mass and student athletes? And then I have one more question following that. Sure, so going into the fall, we were nervous about it. We had, had we have some evidence that when you are conducting doing strenuous, vigorous exercise, there could be some challenge in breathing. So we did have that exemption in our executive orders and in our guidelines going into the fall. Other states, other places didn't adopt that same policy. We consulted with those different states, those different public health officers, and the experience from the fall was that athletes were able to both perform and wear face coverings. There was little resistance to those requirements in those different settings because it was a pathway to play. So we are adopting that guidance now, especially given what's going on in the state of Maine. And can you talk about um, some of the conversations with the MPA um, in regards to winter sports from this week? So there is a statement, I think, that Maine uh, Principals Association will be issuing today about our work. We have always tried to do a balance between public health guidance, which is our purview, providing the kind of sound advice on requirements and recommendations to guide activities like sports, as well as recognizing that school sports are taking places on school grounds, in school gyms, often with school personnel. So we try to do our policy in the community sports realm aligned with the policy in the school sports realm. We think at this moment, we're perfectly aligned, including on the requirement to wear face coverings, the uh, additional start dates for different types of sports that are moderate risk, really trying to set out a calendar that gets us past some of the holidays for additional engagement, as well as ongoing monitoring of the situation. So we uh, feel good working with Department of Education, the Principals Association, the superintendents, the school boards on a way to try to move forward um, with as much consensus as possible, recognizing again, our primary goal, especially with regard to schools, is to maintain an environment for in-person learning where it's safe to do so. Thank you both. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, over to Joel Oliver. Um, yes, hi, thank you. Um, a question for uh, Commissioner Lambrew, uh, following up on the uh, community sports, high school sports. Um, so as you probably know, well, we noticed that the um, community sports guidelines changed from recommendations to requirements. And so, um, and then as you probably know, uh, community sports, uh, I'm thinking specifically AAU basketball and uh, recreational youth and adult ice hockey, I guess I shouldn't say adult, but youth ice hockey have been happening throughout the fall. And then um, you have a start date of December uh, 14th, I believe, for um, winter sports. So does that mean that uh, these uh, organizations that have ongoing games and et cetera during the fall that they're supposed to stop what they're doing now and wait until December to start up again? The short answer is yes. We think at this time, given what is going on with COVID-19 in Maine, that for moderate risk sports, irrespective of where they take place in schools or in community-based settings, should, first of all, um, not be engaging in practices in competition, given the risk of COVID-19 spread in these sports. These are moderate risk sports where people, you know, athletes are closer to each other, there's more physical contact, there's more of that sustained interaction that would yield risk. So we would align the schedules and to be precise, the schedule would have skills and drills, level one activity beginning on December 7th. That's about a week after Thanksgiving, making sure we get past that time, that's a higher risk time. 
practices and intramural scrimmages, which are levels two and three, could begin on December 14th. And then competitions will begin on or after January 11th with a check-in around January 1st to see how things are going. That schedule is very similar to the one already announced in New Hampshire as well as Vermont. We are looking at all New England sports to make sure that we do have this regional alignment because this is not about um, us trying to be different or unique or special in this case. We all wanna be grounded in public health to try to ensure that we can have sports continue safely. But for these moderate sports, we really want to align the schedule. Okay, so just one more time, I believe I understand what you're saying, but um, all moderate risk uh, youth sports, basketball, ice hockey, et cetera, if they're operating right now, they, they must be uh, shut down until uh, December, not should be shut down, but must be, right? We believe that it is not safe right now to be having moderate risk sport activities continuing. We have put the start date back past the holidays, past Thanksgiving for our practices in intramural, past uh, the winter holidays for competition in the interest of trying to keep those players, referees, their families and their community safe. Okay, great. And I just have one question for uh, Dr. Shaw. Um, so getting back to the contact tracing that you were mentioning at the beginning, um, the, the 3.5 close contacts versus the 5.8. Um, I know I noticed the 3.5 is from March to the present. Um, I don't know if you've drilled down into these numbers yet, but like say March to May or June, was the, the number of close contacts even lower than 3.5? Do you know? Yep. Um, Joe, I'm glad you raised that. I am trying to recall from when I pulled this from the spreadsheet what that number early on in that in that first quarter of the pandemic was. It was definitely lower. Um, I'll, I'll go back and we'll we'll find the exact number, Joe. But yes, yeah, so it was it was certainly lower, reflecting the fact that at that time so many folks were staying close indoors during that time period. Um, now, of course, there's more folks outside, and that is a one, there's one one of the many reasons right now where the number of cases is rising because folks are just out and about more. But let me go back and see if I can pull that exact number from that more, uh, more specific time period, Joe. And then just real quick, sorry to take up so much time, but is the fact that at the beginning of the pandemic that there was more uh, outbreaks or cases in congregate care settings, is that possibly also another reason why the close contact numbers were lower at that time? Yes, uh, th that's that's also that, correct. That is another uh, rationale because the individuals, the residents who are in those settings may have many fewer contacts than say younger folks. So I, I think, let me flip it a little bit differently. That is sort of a, a, there's a byproduct or a function of that, which is the average age of cases. Average age of cases in Maine has fallen, even adjusting for testing. And younger folks who are out and about at work, socializing, are likely to have more close contacts than an older person who is a resident of a congregate care facility. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Jackie at News Center. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thanks so much for taking my question. I'm gonna stick with um, the sports theme for a second, just kind of as a follow-up. Um, you know, there have been some sports being played right now, hockey and basketball and other winter sports. Is there any reason that the state, you know, has to believe that there is an increased spread of COVID-19 playing those sports? Dr. Shaw can add to this as well, but we have seen examples both here in Maine and in different states of outbreaks associated with sports. There was an athletic facility in Warren, Maine, where we believe that there's an outbreak associated with basketball. Some of our school-based outbreaks here in Maine have a disproportionate number of athletes who are in those outbreaks. And we have clear, large outbreaks related to ice hockey in states like New Jersey, New Hampshire and Vermont and Massachusetts, all three suspended uh, hockey because of the concern, the evidence of outbreaks. We just have to be, you know, exercise extra caution at a time when we see community spread when it comes to sports. But Dr. Shaw, do you have anything to add? No, I was going to underscore what you noted, Commissioner Lambrew, which is in conversations with my counterparts in states across the Northeast, they have reported significant outbreaks. Uh, Commissioner Lambrew noted New Jersey, which has, as of when I spoke with my counterpart there, 
uh, 14 outbreaks uh, as of a few days ago associated uh, with, ice, with ice hockey itself. These are not 14 cases. This is 14 outbreaks associated with hockey games. So we, as we've always done, take a look not just at what's going on in Maine, but what we're seeing in other states so we can learn from that. And speaking of some other states, um, we saw today the US CDC did a study um, studying the state of Delaware from April to June. And it looks like, you know, by using mitigation measures like staying home and interventions like contact tracing and isolation, they were able to reduce hospitalizations by 88% mortality by 100%. What can we learn from Delaware? Yep. And you know, I had the chance to, again, chat with my counterpart there in Delaware as they were getting ready to release that. Thankfully, many of the steps that are noted in that article, in fact, all of the steps that were noted in that, that, that case report and that summary have been in place in Maine. Uh, and what, was, what is interesting about that research is that Delaware found what we have experienced in Maine as well and what we chatted about a moment ago, which is one of the best ways to lower hospitalizations is to lower the rates of COVID-19 in the community. Uh, old saying in public health that what's predictable is preventable. And when case rates in the community go up, we can predict that hospitalizations and sadly deaths will go up as well. One of the things that we can do right now to keep folks out of the hospital is to keep the overall level of COVID-19 across our community as low as possible. But thankfully the summary from Delaware, I think for me, reinforced that the measures and the steps that we've taken in Maine are in line with what the CDC recognizes as best national practices. And I just have one more question. Um, on Wednesday, you referenced um, what you called pandemic fatigue. Um, you know, people might be lightening up on the restrictions and things like that. What advice do you have for people that might be feeling this pandemic fatigue? You know, I think my advice for folks right now as we go into the weekend is two things. The first is take a moment to take stock of what's at stake here. Um, it's not just about keeping yourself safe. It's not just about keeping your family safe. Community transmission and keeping a lid on it is literally about keeping folks who are the most vulnerable among us as safe as possible. Individuals are family members who live in long-term care facilities, keeping them safe. It's also about keeping our kids in school for in-person education for as long as we can. So yeah, we're absolutely all fatigued and tired. But if we think about what's at stake, why are we doing this? I think that for me at least provides a new motivation to make sure, as Commissioner Lambert said, when I go outside of my office, I've always got a face mask on. If I'm out walking the dog, I've always got a face mask on because I always wanna remind myself what's at stake. The other thing, as we go into the weekend and we all are grappling with pandemic fatigue, what I'm asking everyone to do is to bear in mind that it can happen to you. One of the things that we've heard about when our case investigators talk to people who have been tested positive, one of the refrains that we hear over and over is, gosh, I didn't think it could happen to me. I live in a safe place in Maine. I live in a safe county. I live in a safe community. I live in a safe state. I didn't think it could happen to me. And with this most recent spike in cases, now is a time for every single person watching to recognize that it can happen to you. I would rather every single person right now in Maine do the right thing and wear a mask today rather than in a week or two from now have to say, gosh, I wish I had worn a mask that day. So those are the two things that I ask everyone to do, recognizing we're all grappling with pandemic fatigue, but we've all also got to find a new source of inspiration and motivation. Thank you. The last question for the afternoon goes to Patrick Whittle. Oh, hey, Patrick, you're on mute. My apologies. I, uh, thank you very much. I have, uh, I, I have two questions that are very different, so I'm gonna ask them separately. Uh, I'm wondering if there's more that needs to be said about um, the re reclassification of some of the schools into the, into the yellow category. Uh, and also wondering specifically um, if it's possible that, that Cumberland could be in this sort of middle category of being more closely uh, monitored. I think Go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah. Shaw, you, you jump in. So mm -hmm. uh, today at noon, the health advisory that's posted on the Department of Education website 
shows that Somerset as well as Waldo County continue to be yellow. We have seen continued increases in the new cases in both of those counties. We have added Knox as well as, um, ready, what's our other one? Uh, we added Knox County as well as Somerset County and then Franklin County. I'm Franklin, sorry. Knox and Franklin Frank, are the yeah, two new ones. Yeah. Apologies for that. Um, mm -hmm. Again, because we have seen increasing in, in positivity as well as case rates of those counties, we did move Waldo County from yellow to green with asterisks, meaning we're watching closely. We have not seen as many new cases in Waldo County, but we're closely watching. But we have added the asterisk, meaning we're watching closely to Canada County, where we've had a number of outbreaks that give us pause. So those are the counties that we are, we are recommending that the school administrators, the local decision makers in schools look at what's going on in terms of hybrid in-person learning in those counties, because that indicator is solely for the purpose of making those school decisions. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Cumberland County, we too are watching Cumberland County, but its numbers include the 100-ish residents at the main correctional center who are not actually going to be in the community in the near term. They will not actually affect in-person learning in Cumberland County. All that said, we have had a number of outbreaks open up in Cumberland County. So it, like all other counties in Maine, are ones that we're watching closely. Patrick, I'll just add, won't be a surprise. This is all the more reason that I really am urging folks to do the right thing, do the common sense thing and, and wear a face covering. That's a way that we can keep rates of COVID in the community as low as possible, which is helpful to facilitate kids being in school in person as long as possible. The two have a direct relationship with one another. Um, that's a really good segue because my other question pertains to masks uh, specifically. You've, um, you've mentioned a couple of times that not all masks are created equal. And I, I, I apologize to people who can't see my face because I'm gonna use a visual aid. But uh, most of the time when I wear a mask, I wear one that's like this. Mm -hmm. One of these, where in a normal situation, you would see them on healthcare workers, the ubiquitous mm -hmm. blue masks. Yep. However, I more enjoy wearing this homemade mask, which advertises my neighbor's lobstering business. It's made out of part of a shirt. I have, lots of people love to wear these homemade masks. I have no idea if they're as effective as commercial grade masks and I would love it if you could speak to that. Sure, Patrick. Um, there's, not, there's not one, well, there's not a one size fits all answer uh, for, for this, but here are some principles to look for to make sure that the mask or face covering that you're wearing is doing the job. The first is that one of the reasons I like the surgical masks uh, as well as other masks is the nose bridge that can be fitted around your nose, that reduces the likelihood that any aerosol particles could escape from your nose. Uh, I also like these because they tend to be a good bit tighter and, and not as loose fitting, which reduces the likelihood that particles could spread from underneath. So that's one thing. The other principle is that uh, the material matters. Uh, the more plies that the mask has, the better. Uh, two ply is very good. Even some masks now are even having more. The plies are a proxy for something that I think is a handy guide, which is if you put the mask up to the light and you can see discrete holes in it, especially if you stretch it out a little bit, it's not doing its job of reducing the transmission of aerosols from your mouth to the, to the outside world. Uh, I can't speak for the t-shirt that, you know, that, that you noted there, but if it's the kind of thing where when stretched, you can see right through it, it's yeah. not doing that, yeah, that's a big time failure just now on that one. Oh, well. Yeah, and, and I, I'm gathering that the mask that you modeled also doesn't have the nose bridge. That's no, another it thing. It did. Okay, so the nose bridge is really helpful, but the quality and the number of plies in the material are also helpful. The good thing about masks these days is that you don't need to, you don't necessarily need one of these surgical masks. They're available. Drugstores, pharmacies have them nowadays, but you don't need them. Any mask that's specially designed for the purpose of being a face covering, that's got multiple plies, that's got that nose bridge, that's tight fitting across your mouth, that's going under your chin, that's going to do the job. Great to know. Thank you so much. So thanks, Patrick. Um, that was the last question for the afternoon. Um, I will just wrap us up with, with two final observations. Uh, the first is that 
rates of COVID-19 are expanding rapidly across our state. And with those expanding rates, we are seeing an increasing positivity rate, but sadly we're seeing more hospitalizations, more folks in the intensive care unit, more folks on ventilators, and sadly an increasing number of individuals who have passed away. There are concrete things that every single person who's watching today can do right now to help all of us stay safe. Chief among them is wearing a face covering. By wearing a face covering, we will all be that much safer. That is the right thing to do right now. But you can also do things like avoiding gatherings. And if you are in a gathering in your own home, by wearing face coverings inside. I'm gonna end with this. These steps are the way for all of us to stay safe. So I'm asking everyone, do the right thing. There is a lot riding on it. So with that, Commissioner Lambrou and I thank you for your time this afternoon. We look forward to catching up again next week. In the meantime, please be kind and take care of one another. We'll talk again soon.